in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, and welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is Larry Wingett, the Pitbull of Personal Development. Larry, nice for being with us today. Oh, I appreciate you having me. Thanks. So Pitbull, why Pitbull? I've never had a Pitbull in my life. I like lads. <laughs> you should have had a Pitbull. They're loyal, strong, and what Pitbulls are mostly known for is they grab onto something and they do not let go. Hmm. Years ago, somebody told me, that there are lots of different kinds of speakers out there, but I'm truly the pit bull. And I sort of grabbed on to that idea. In fact, it's become a registered trademark, the pit bull of personal development, because I grab onto something and don't let go. I grab onto personal responsibility, telling people to take responsibility in every area of their lives. I talk about core values. Those are the things that I never compromise, always go to every single time, no matter what the topic is. Now, how, how did how did the pit bull get started? I mean, did it, was it you just met a lot of people that never took ownership, didn't know what their core values was like? How does one become a personal development coach? Well, I've been doing this for thirty years plus at this point, and I became a professional speaker because I was good at it. I started out as a sales trainer, discovered that people thought I was funny. I figured out quickly that they pay you a whole lot more to make people laugh than they do teach them how to sell. And along the way, as a very successful sort of motivational humorist, I realized that I hated every word that came out of my mouth. I didn't believe most of that motivational crap that all these people talk about, all the positive attitude stuff and, and all of those things. And one day I just said, I can't do this anymore. Hmm. I'm going to tell people what I really think. And at that time, I went on stage when I was going through this sort of authenticity crisis, not liking what I had to say, mm -hmm. and somebody heckled me. And they heckled me, and I turned and said, you know, buddy, you ought to shut up, stop whining, get a lie. And the crowd gave me a standing ovation. And I realized that's a good line. Shut up, stop whining, and get a lie. I started telling that story, and then I said, someday I'm going to write a book called Shut Up, Stop Whining, Get a Life. And I did, sold the book, and the first week it was out, it went to number one on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And I was on to something. So I became the contrarian of the personal development industry. I came out at a time when all those people were, were nothing but, um, I believe, sort of poodles of personal development, and I went at it hard. And I sort of trashed all the motivational cliches that were out there and told people the truth. Chances are, if you're not doing well, it's because you're lazy. Chances are, you're not working near hard enough. Chances are, you don't have any core values. People don't like you. People don't trust you. You're dishonest. You don't have integrity. And you need to get off your butt and go to work. And that was not what other people were saying with this all this believe in yourself and the world's a wonderful, nice, friendly place. Not the case. Now, you're also speaking from experience. Would you mind unpacking to our audience your personal story and kind of why, where you came from and why you have the validity to say something like this? Well, I've read in the last 35 years over 5,000 books. I believe every speaker ought to speak from research as well as experience. And we've got a lot of people out there who say, this is my story. That's not experience. Your story is never experience. It's, I mean, it's always experience. It's not research. And so I believe we got way too much experience and not near enough research. So I went out there and actually studied what other people have done to become successful. That's why I've read over 5,000 books. But I started out dirt poor in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, grew up really not having very much. And I made a decision that that was not going to be the rest of my life. I was going to do whatever it took to be successful and to have money. And so I knew I could do one thing better than anybody else. I could outwork everybody else. And so I was willing to do whatever it took to become successful through my hard work, my, my studying, uh, whatever it took. I did a lot of different jobs. Ended up in Southwestern Bell. I was one of the very first male telephone operators. When I left Southwestern Bell and AT&T, 
uh, years later, I was the area sales manager for the state of Kansas for AT&T. I progressed very rapidly through hard work and uh, started my own telecommunications company. Went to work one day and the Corporation Commission in Oklahoma ruled what I did to be illegal. And so I was put out of business. Hmm. Uh, I was selling business telephone systems. They said only a telephone company could do that. So uh, I lost my company. Damn government. Yeah. I lost my company and I said, here's what I know how to do. Do I know how to teach people how to sell, and that's why I started as a sales trainer. But I've just had your typical experience of a guy who's uh, been around a while, a lot of ups, mostly downs. Learned from them, worked my butt off along the way, looked at what other people were doing that made them successful, and duplicated that. And then I figured out how to get an angle, which is the pit bull thing, in being incredibly direct with people, and they appreciate that. I like what you said about research and experience. What yeah. were some of the sources you went to for research? What were you looking for? What were you trying to understand? Well, again, sadly, when you look at my industry, everybody relies only on their experience and they're not doing any research. So I really did read everything I could lay my hands on. First of all, I, I looked at people in the speaking industry. I went to Brian Tracy and Jim Rohn and Zig Ziglar and all the big names at the time, the big motivational guys, and said, what are they saying? Not so I could say it, but what are they saying that resonates with crowds and why does it resonate with crowds? I looked at uh, preachers and said, how do they do this that so they can make a connection with an audience? I wanted to say politicians, how do they build a connection? Because my industry is based on not only content. Content is overrated. My industry, really, the successful are the people who figure out how to make a connection with the audience. And you make a connection with people. I don't care what you're selling, from speeches to lawn care, it wouldn't matter, based on the pain they're going through, what they're dealing with. So I look at everything. This is what's going on in the world. This is how it's showing up in people's lives. This is how it's hurting them. This is what it's costing them. And if I can relate to people based on that, then they will connect with me and go, wow, he gets me. Anytime you know that someone gets you, we elevate trust. That's what I think a leader does. That's what I think a speaker does. That's what a politician has to do. That's what we all have to do is elevate trust so people will listen to us. And we only do that around a connection, and the connection must be based on, I understand what you're going through. I see how it hurts you. I know what it's costing you. And now let me give you some ideas for dealing with it. That's a great point right there. Looking to religious leaders. Interesting, Larry. Now, I'm sensing Back a little... When it comes to using a stage, religious leaders are. I'm sure, I'm sure. Now, I'm sensing a little beef now with the industry. Maybe a little... Uh, you got a void to, to kill? I mean, what, what's going on? Who are the other people in the industry? Why are they taking you off? <laughs> it was the industry as a whole that sort of ticked me off. Uh, not so much. I don't care anymore. Uh, I really am past the point of giving much of a damn about what the other people do in the business. I believe that the industry has allowed people, the self-help industry, has allowed people to suffer in comfort. You know, all the motivational folks, the motivational, I call them bozos. Most people call them gurus. But most of the motivational bozos out there will paint you this beautiful picture of how beautiful it is over there, how great it is over there. And then they will try to encourage you to join them in the beautiful place. I don't believe that's how people really change their lives. I don't motivate people to go to a better place. In fact, I also own the trademark, the world's only irritational speaker. But because I believe I can make you so irritated with where you are, you will do anything to go someplace else. We don't change seeking comfort. We change to avoid pain. So if I understand the pain you're going through and what it's costing you and you get you to agree with me, you'll be willing to make that change. People don't change because you want them to change. People change when they want to change because it's so uncomfortable doing what they've been doing. Larry, I like you because you're a realist. This is the Realist Podcast. You just call it how it is. You're a straight shooter. I want to have you on. We're really fortunate to have someone like you on now. Do you believe, though, personally, that everyone can get off their ass and make a living by themselves and change their lives? And then if they do so, 
is success con- constant? Is it changing? Does success change for you? Is success just making a lot of money? No, success is not just making a lot of money. Uh, there are lots of folks who made a lot of money, and I certainly wouldn't call them successful. I think it comes down to balance. You know, success is getting whatever you want in life without sacrificing all the other areas of your life. And if you've sacrificed your family, you've made a lot of money, are you successful? No, I would call you a loser. If you make a lot of money and you have a great family, but you sacrificed your health along the way, are you successful? No, I'd still call you a loser. So we have to have that level of balance. As far as can anyone do it, I believe this. If anyone can do it, anyone can do it. Hmm. Now, what are some examples you like to draw from, whether they be in your books, in your speeches, of people who have been in a position of pain and suffering and have transformed their lives? Well, I don't do a lot of the the typical inspiration, motivational story talking about Uh, like the mountain climber people who say, you know, I climbed that mountain. I didn't make it the first three to all bull. I just show people how their actions end up hurting them. You know, for instance, when you look at society today, over 50% of Americans spend more money than they make. Really? They spend more money than they make. Now, that statement means nothing until I say let me show you how stupid that is and what that costs you. You can't send your kids to college. You're going to be buried in student loan debt that you've co-signed for. And it's anything goes wrong, you're going to be buried in debt, sacrifice your retirement, sacrifice their financial opportunities. You're going to be destroyed all because people don't know how to spend less than they earn. Now, see, that's a pain point that go, wow. Or I show people, do you love your kids? Really, you love them? I'm glad you love your kids. Smoking three packs a day, don't tell me how much you love your kids. Don't, because I don't believe you do love your kids. If you love your kids, you'd put the cigarettes down because you could then figure out a way to live long enough to enjoy your kids and your grandkids. So I sort of draw out the contradictions of people's words and their behavior, make them feel the pain of their behavior so they make the decision all on their own. Man, I've been an idiot. I need to fix this. I even wrote a book called People Are Idiots and I Can Prove It. New York Times bestseller. And it was the easiest book I ever wrote because you just look around at all the stupid things people do. Mm. Now I'm thinking about that addiction example tough habit to, to kick sometimes. Now, what are some things people can do to take that first step, to take ownership, to take accountability, to get off their butt and start making some changes? What do you suggest people do? Regardless of what you want to stop doing in your life, it really comes down to this. Just stop. You know, if you want to quit smoking cigarettes, stop putting cigarettes in your mouth. Hmm. Just stop doing that. If you don't want to be fat, stop eating. You know, that's what it always gets. You know, people, again, it goes back to the motivational idea versus the irritational idea. Let me paint this pretty picture so you'll go over there. Let me show you what health looks like. Let me show you what, man, forget all that stuff. It always comes down to you giving something up. If you're not willing to give something up and to sacrifice, you're never going to be successful at anything. Hmm. You see, we have an industry that has been built around and It's evident everywhere saying you can have it all. No, you really can't. You really can't have it all. You're going to have to choose. So you're going to have to say, what do I really want enough to do whatever it takes to give up? You know, we tell people they can get successful, become successful. That's not how it works. You've got to give up what's keeping you from being successful. You don't get skinny, you give up what's making you fat. You don't get healthy, you give up what's making you unhealthy. You don't get rich, you give up what's making you broke. So until people are willing to give something up, and they only are willing to give something up when it hurts so much, they don't have any other choice. But until they're willing to give it up, they're not going to ever be successful. 
So what do you think? Do you, you think there's something wrong with this society right now that people are saying? Now, for instance, we, we just, I've had a lot of guests on the show that have talked about the opioid crisis, the opioid epidemic, opioid yeah. addiction, strong addiction. Um, I've had family members go through it as well. It's very difficult to get them off. They're not them when they're on the drugs. However, with that being said, it seems like your argument's pretty essential. It's just, you know, you need to stop. It's just you. You can do it. And it's only you that needs to do it as well. Now, it seems for me, the people that we've had on the show around this topic have made maybe excuses for other people. It is them. It's the drug. It's not them. You know, oh, we, we're going to get you a, a treatment center. We're going to, you know, we need to put you on better food. It's <clears> not you. You know, is that a problem you see with society that people are kind of blanketing others that are that maybe giving them a little bit more cushion than they actually need? Yes, yeah, it's, it's what I said a moment ago about we allow people to suffer in comfort. Most people don't change their ways when they suffer in comfort. They change their ways when it hurts so bad mm. that they're not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we we want to rescue people from that pain. I get so many letters. I had a television show on A&E for years uh, called Big Spender, and it was about people in financial crisis. And I still, to this day, as a result of that, and I, I had a best-selling personal finance book, but I have people write and say, my sister, and then they'll tell me their sister story, could you help my sister? No, I can't help your sister, and you can't either. If she's a spender, she's got to spend to the point that she sees the disaster, feels the pain of the disaster, and makes the decision on her, on her very own for things to be different. Again, people don't change because we want them to change or because we think they need to change. People change when they hurt so much and they don't have any other options. We have to allow people to feel the pain of their stupidity, to feel the pain of their mistakes, to feel the pain of their decisions. Consequences drive behavior. And when we remove the consequences, we're not going to see a change in behavior. A lot of people may take this the wrong way, Larry. I'm sure you've experienced a lot of people. I heard that you've received a few death threats over the years. Um, now, why do you think that is? Why do you think people aren't receptive to constructive criticism? Because at the end of the day, Larry, you're actually trying to help these people. You know, <clears throat> I'm trying to present the information so if they choose to use it, they could be helped. I'm not trying to help anybody. My obligation is I, I believe if you have a solution to a problem, you are obligated to offer that solution. But I'm not here to convince anybody. Okay. I sh show the problem. I show the solution as I see it to that problem. And if they choose to participate, that's on them. If they choose not to participate, that's on them too. So I'm not out there trying to convince anybody of anything. And the reason I get the death threats and the reason people... Uh, don't like what I have to say. Shoot, I got a death threat just because uh, I told people to spend less money than they earn and raise your kids. Shoot, you know that core principle kind of stuff, core values kind of thing that we were should have been raised with. And that causes people to believe I ought to die. Really? That's because the truth hurts. And the more it hurts, the more defensive we have come, become. And we want to say, you're wrong, I'm right. Now, obviously, the results show that you're wrong, and I'm probably wrong. Hmm. Interesting. Now, when you're on Big Spender, and you, you got this show now, and people are starting to take note of who you are, your message, what you stand for, uh, what price or cost does that come with? I mean, are you dealing with uh, a lot of negative people? How do you flush those things out? What cost comes with fame? What cost comes with, explain that better for me. First of all, the show's no longer on. What, what do you mean? Correct. Yeah, does, does any cost come with uh, being popular and having a lot of people know about you and, and speaking all the time and hearing your voice? Uh, oh. for, you know, and, and uh, you know, you're a pretty opinionated person. I mean, do a lot of people attack you? And how's, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I deal with it differently now than I did uh, a few years ago. I, there was a time that you try to justify why you are the way you are. You try to explain yourself. And then you, you know, there's an old, old, old saying that when you wrestle with a pig, you both get dirty, but the pig likes it. <laughs> and so when I get pushed back, I used to kind of wrestle with the pig. 
and I would get dirty with it. And then I said, I'm not going to change their mind. I have nothing to justify, nothing to defend. The truth is the truth, whether you approve of it or not. Just because you disagree doesn't make you right. And so I simply, at this point, I just present it. If you don't like it, please go on your way. And you know, in terms of, I, I get a lot of hate mail. Uh, I'm always confused by that, why I do. Uh, I get a lot of pushback on social media. And your best friend on social media is your finger because your finger can reach up there and hit delete, ban, block, unfriend. It's just terrific. It's a great platform. It's interesting though. It's like that people will take the time to give you a hard time. Why do you think that is? Why do you think is, is, is society and culture like it's changed so much? Is it just crazy to you? I mean, you started this sales process flipping through yellow pages. Now we've got Twitter and people at the thumbs reaching out to you and telling you how much they don't approve or, or approve of, of your um, you know sayings. Yeah, that's because of uh, anonymity. It's real easy to set back and basically you're completely anonymous and you can say whatever you want to to anybody with no recourse. Mm. We get a, to be as vitriolic as we choose. And what are you going to do? You're going to block me, argue with me, ban me. I don't care. That's And the more you argue with them, you're just feeding the trolls. I think the best way to deal with trolls is to starve them out. <laughs> now, Larry. You mentioned a few of your books, but one of yeah. my personal favorite titles of yours is Grow a Pair. Yeah. Now, when I read that book, I was just like, oh, now, all right, I, I got to have this guy on the show. This is, this, this is unbeatable. But to also balance that, it's also like we came out with this list of top 50 keynote speakers, which you are on. Yeah. Now, I didn't know if you knew this, but only eight of the 50 members are females. And that's something that we didn't acknowledge. It's a contributor wrote it. We approved it, and we congratulate 50 people on the list. Now, gender equality is a major topic uh, in business society today. There's no doubt about that, and people are becoming more sensitive to titles like that of your book. Have you received any lash, uh, flat, lashback from that, and does a title like that steer away a female-based audience? Didn't seem to. Okay. Because, uh, first of all, I think in, in terms of your list, and you only have eight of the 50 who are – who are women. I think in five years, that will, if you created a new list of the top 50 keynote speakers in the world, that would shift a lot. I think it will. Absolutely. It, it will because we've been at this. I've been at this 30 years. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the folks on the list, I mean, we've been at this so long and it was a different time. So actually fewer women were keynoters when mm. we, most of us started out. There. So that just, that changes over time. That'll take care of itself. It really will. Hmm. Uh, in terms of pushback over titles like Grow a Pair, you know, I said clearly in the book, and I've been real clear, that growing a pair is not about what's between your legs, but what's between your ears. And it's about standing up for what you believe, standing up for your values, speaking up for those values. And that has nothing to do with what sex you are. It has everything to do with clarity and priorities. And now, people have been very accepting. I like that. Interesting. Between the years, uh, success to you, is it an external game or is it an internal game? It's got to be both. Both. It's got to be both. Uh, I, I, I don't think you can truly, from the inside, feel successful if you don't externally feel successful mm. in some way. I don't mm. mean you don't have to have the multi-million dollar house and, and drive the big, you don't have to do any of that stuff. But if you are embarrassed by your externals, I don't think you can internally feel as successful as you convince yourself to feel. But for me, after a while, you do reach this point where it's, only about the internals. Once you've achieved the externals, then how do you feel about yourself? Are you every single day in alignment? Are you authentic uh, in every way? You know, my goal is for people to say, you know, I don't like him, but he's a real deal. You see, I think at the end of the day, people really 
pretty much don't believe what you have to say. I don't think people even listen to what you have to say. But I do think they listen to see if you believe what you have to say. I want people to listen to me whether they like me or not, whether they believe me or not, whether they hate every word that comes out of my mouth and know that I'm really authentic. I believe this stuff. And I don't care. I'm not seeking your approval. I believe it because those are my values. The last thing I do every single night, like most people, is I stand in front of my bathroom mirror and brush my teeth. And as I brush my teeth every single night, I go through this. Have you been the best Larry Lincoln you can be today? Hmm. A lot of days I say, yeah, I was kind of a jerk when I did this. Or, Larry, you were kind of an ass today. You made an ass of yourself. And hmm. so I run through that. I commit to be different. And most days, fortunately, at this point in my life, I go, yeah, you were a good version of Larry Wingett today. You did your best. And you go to bed and sleep. That's how it works. But that, I do that self-assessment every day. That's that's great, Larry. That's great advice, especially for our audience, for myself included. Man, let's just be honest with yourself, too. And I wanted to go back to one thing you had mentioned. You said you get to a point and then you start just reflecting a little bit more about your core values and who you are. So it seems like you kind of started out following that profit. You know, you, you had nothing. You needed to that, <clears throat> have that validation. You needed to make that money. What are you chasing now, though? Complete and utter self-satisfaction. Okay. <laughs> really? Fair enough. Uh, <clears throat> if it doesn't make me happy, I don't do it. If it, I, I don't find it fun and entertaining and enjoyable, mm -hmm. I don't do it. Now, I earn that. Sadly, we sort of are teaching folks that if it doesn't make you happy, don't do it. Uh, if it, uh, it's not entertaining, don't do it. We teach it, and then they put that ahead of what they're maybe being paid to do. And so they become entitled. And mm. if you get those things reversed, entitlement is the result. And if anything's going to take us down as a society, it won't be coronavirus, it won't be politics, it's going to be a sense of entitlement. I earn the right to, at this point in my life, say, I'm going to do what makes me happy every single day. I earned that right, though. Because a lot of times when I went to work, I go, this sucks. But I made a deal, and a deal is a deal, and I have a fiduciary responsibility. I've been paid, and I'm going to do it whether it sucks or not. Damn right. I love it. Now, Larry, where do you think that stems from, though? You think it's a generation thing? I mean, I know plenty, plenty of uh, soft millennials out there, plenty of Gen Zers out there that don't understand the a hard, a hard day's work, work ethic, ethic as well. I'm sure I'm saying I say I might, but I really might not. I mean, you think about the great generation, uh, you know, you think about uh, how they had the Great Recession. They had wars. They had Korea. I'm, I'm going to have my grandpa on the podcast on Thursday. I just want to hear his story. Yeah, you know, he's seen some stuff. He's dealt some stuff. He is a man that came from nothing in his pocket from uh, Chicago, Illinois, to, to literally like Drain, Oregon. You've never heard of Drain, Oregon. It's like it's like almost it's smaller than Muskogee, Oklahoma, Larry. And so you know that's 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 hard work. You know made made himself the, the man he is today. Do you think it's a generation thing? Is it a parenting thing? Where does it stem from for you? It's a parenting thing. The greatest generation, they were great in what they accomplished, but their parenting led to boomers. And, you know, millennials get trashed all the time for being lazy and all that stuff. And I go on national news programs to talk about millennials. and But I'm always quick to say it's only about a third of millennials that we all make fun of. Because the other two thirds, they have more money in the bank. Their finances are much more solid. They have lower debt to equity. I mean, everything they do is pretty much right. Mm. Two thirds of them. One third of them live with their mom and daddy in the basement. Uh, but that generation between the greatest generation of millennials, the boomers, my generation, we're a mess. We screwed a lot of stuff up. But that's because the greatest generation wanted their kids to have so much more. Hmm. And they went a little easy on it. And then the boomers wanted their kids to have more than they did. So they went a little easy on it. This all can be tracked to good parenting. I wrote a best-selling parenting book called Your Kids Are Your Own Fault. 
And that's the most important book I ever wrote because that talks about how to make sure you're raising productive, responsible adults. And that's what we all need to spend a whole lot more time doing, being responsible and being productive. Are you a parent? Oh, yeah. I have two grown sons now, three grandsons. Yep. Congratulations. Now, what was more challenging, this career or parenting? Parenting is the most challenging thing anyone can do. Hmm. And if they don't agree with that, then they're probably lousy parents. If your kids, as teenagers, don't spend about half of their time saying, I hate you, you're probably a lousy parent because you've got to teach them and give them the skills. I did an interview not long ago about finances and retirement and all that. And uh, they said, Larry, uh, what, how do you feel about leaving your kids money? What should we do to make sure we can leave our kids money? I said, I'm not leaving my kids a dime of my money. What I left my kids with was the ability to go earn their own money. I left them the values where they understand uh, about earning money, spending money, investing money, being charitable with money. Those values are more important than the cash I will leave them. Hmm. Those are the values I instill. Was it painful for them? Oh, Lord, yes. But I taught them those values. I taught them other core values. And now, I mean, one's a cop, one's a fashion designer. Very different. However, the values they share around responsibility and productivity, those are universal values that are we've slacked off on that we need to be reminding our kids of. Responsibility, productivity. What are some of your other values that you say are your core beliefs that you could share with our audience today? You know, if you walked up to the average person on the street and say, tell me five things you believe in that you'll never compromise. They will look at you like a dog looking at a ceiling fan. <laughs> they don't have any idea. Can't even give you five things that they believe that they would never compromise. Number one for me is honesty. That, that's it. I do not tolerate being lied to. You lie to me once, you got to make it right. You lie to me twice, I will cut you off at the knees and we will never speak again. That's just the way it is. Uh, I won't be lied to. Honesty is everything to me. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, is it true? Uh, were you honest with other people? Can they trust you and believe you? <laughs> you know, the, the number one rule for business success as well as life success is to do what you said you would do when you said you would do it the way you said you would do it. Hmm. That's based in honesty. Everybody wants that. I want that from my employees. My employees want it from me. I want it from my kids. My kids want it from me. I want it from the people I do business with. The people I do business with, they want that from me as a customer. Just do what we said we would do when we said we would do it the way we said we would do it. So honesty is my number one value. And that bleeds over into integrity and honesty and integrity drive how we do our business, how we raise our kids, how we pay our bills into every area of our life. So is that the advice then for the next generation? The honesty, the core values, the soul searching? Is it reflection? What's the advice for the next generation to understand this and avoid the entitlement that could take down this world? You know, I wrote six New York Times bestsellers, Wall Street Journal bestsellers about telling people when you're in this situation with your money, do these things. In business, do these things. In your life, do these things. All about telling people what to do. And here's what I discovered after selling a couple million books translated into over 20 languages. People don't do it. Because, Simple as that. yeah, they don't, they don't do yeah. what they know would work for them, at least not for very long. Why? Because they're not the right kind of people. And so my, the last big book I wrote was called What's Wrong with Damn Near Everything? And it's about the collapse of core values. And so if we go back to making people good people, then good people do the right things. If I take a bad employee who's not a good guy and I say, you go do these things, they will for that long. They won't do it forever. Good people, however, when you tell them what to do, good people will do it. Why? Because they're good people. Right. We need to spend our time helping people be good people. And so certainly the number one job as a parent 
is to teach our kids to be good human beings. It sounds so simple, but real. It's a real answer, you know, Larry, and we appreciate your time on the show today. We've talked about a lot. And when I'm about to ask you this question, when I refer to the term as real leader, I'm not referring to a business leader. I'm just re referring to a person or a leader. So Larry, had you on the show, talked a lot about core values today, talked a lot about being real with people that you're not going to tell someone to do, but it just is up to them. You're going to give them the research and the advice. To you, Larry Winget, what is your definition of a real leader? A person who can look themselves in the eye every single night and be proud of who they are as well as their actions and inspires others to do their best and be their best. To me, that's what leadership is about. Inspiring people to be better people and have better actions as a result of that. Through their own example, through their words, that's what it comes down to. Wise words from the pit bull of personal development here on the Real Ears Podcast today for Larry Wingate. I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, be a better person. And always, folks, keep it real. Larry, appreciate your time, my friend. Thanks for having me.